That is another jet star. That's Lockheed's uh, demonstrated airplane. Now, is that one? I can't see from here. Is that four or two, two engine? Is that what? Well, the jet star came with four or two engines, right? With no. Not true. Okay. It came with four engines. Okay, period. They built two prototype airplanes before they decided to produce it for sale mm -hmm. for demonstrators. And as they built those, Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works built them so quick that the engines that they planned, the Pratt & Whitney engines, which are all the other airplanes, uh, which is a smaller engine, I can't remember the thrust now, but a smaller engine, they, they didn't have them ready. They were, they were not in, available. So Kelly Johnson looked around and found a, a, a British Orpheus engine that had roughly the same thrust that he wanted out of four. Out of two, it would have them out of two engines, so mm -hmm. he just put one of those on each side. The airframe was complete and ready to go, and he couldn't wait to get a flight test on it, so he got the other engines and put it on there and, and flew those two airplanes with two engines only. That was purely a, okay. a method of getting flight test on the airplane. He had I no see. intention. A lot of talk over the years about did he intend to make two engine airplane? No, he didn't. Okay. But, um, so what were you doing at this company? There's more pictures here. You can, flight you go safety. Through. So yeah. uh, just to regroup here, you're at flight safety, and um, what what was your job there? And uh, this is a picture of you in the classroom. Well, at this moment, I was teaching uh, what you call just a classroom stand-up classroom instructor for the Jet Star. Okay. But in addition to that, I did some weekend and evening work in the simulator. Flight Safety had the only Jet Star simulator that there was. There were two later, but at this time there was only one, and it wasn't Lockheed. Lockheed never did make one. Hmm. And Al Uche figured he could make money, so he ordered one out of England. He got a simulator built in England, and had it shipped over here and started Jet Star classes. And uh, the, it was a two week course for the initial pilot training and one week for the refreshers. And the two week course was 20,000. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people. Somebody over here, there were twelve people in that class, that's pretty good income. Yeah. So flight safety has always made, always made a lot of money at a high price. But their prestige is such that the companies that, that uh, come to send their people to school here get a big insurance break oh. on their pilots when they go. If you say you've been through flight safety, you almost got a rubber stamp, you know, you're okay. Wow. You can get cheap rates. Mm -hmm. And that saved a lot of companies, a lot of money apparently, so that's where Al made his money. Al Uche had been, flight safety had been in the training business long before the Jetstar. When Jetstar was the first jet, they'd been in the other airline airplanes and other corporate airplanes, but that was the first jet. But later, years later than that, all up the last 2000, year 2000 today, they train on almost every jet. Any jet that sells enough to make it worthwhile, they'll set up a simulator and hmm. teach classes on it. Still in business. Yeah. And, uh, and a very, do a very good business. I thought we did a pretty good job. They have good equipment. You can see the training day devices they have here. Yeah. And they got buttons on the desk for the, for you run a slide thing up here on the screen. and, and Put out questions and go back and forth. Good ways to do do teaching. So uh, I enjoyed that, but I, I started there. I didn't start there. I started just doing some teaching in the simulator. When the students come through the two-week course, they spend two weeks in class. But each evening, not every evening, but some by schedule, they get about 20 hours of simulator time each. Mm -hmm. And so that had to go also, so I did a lot of that. So you had disconnected from Lockheed and went? Oh yeah, this was after I've been to Tulsa and California. Oh, okay, this is, this is after <coughs> this floor is, or whatever uh -huh. it's called. This is 1988, I think I started here. Okay. No, that's not right. 1978 I started here. Okay. And I stayed there until 88. Did you always teach the same plane? Yeah, only the Jetstar. Okay. I was a, the reigning Jetstar expert then. Where Where was this? Where? Yeah. In, in my hometown. 
in George, in uh, George. Well, I was always getting a job walking out the door and looking around. I didn't go. This was walking. in Marietta. Yeah. <laughs> Jobs Lock, came to you. It sounds Lockheed, like it was Lockheed Plants in Marietta. This was in Marietta. It was just down the street and across the street on the other side from Lockheed. Okay. What's next there? I think more pictures of this school. I'm sure. There's yeah. the simulator. This is just our simulator. Uh huh. Who yeah. programmed that simulator? Uh, English company. People. Okay. They probably had some pretty hefty computers running it back in those days. Yeah, they had a whole bank of computers. Yeah. All these things. They had a room. This room was full of them. And Flight Safety had full time people in that room day and night running, the, keeping the computers going. <clears throat> but uh, occasionally they would. Turn and turn them off, and once in a while I'd go in there and have to turn the thing on. But I, I got checked out on that. It was kind of an involved process, steps about ten steps you had to go through to get it turned on. And I got acquainted with that, learned how to do it, which most of the people there did not. But I wanted to be able to do that, so I did that sometimes. But I didn't know a thing about it. But the funny story that came with it, who programmed that, <laughs> is that one time. They had some troubles that the local people couldn't solve, and they quick called somebody from England, and this guy showed up one day, and they introduced me to him. We were talking, and he took the Jetstar pilot's handbook. They were telling him what the trouble was. It was flying funny in this regime. And he took the pilot's handbook, and he just flipped the pages like reading, like speed that. reading, huh? <laughs> just, 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 just about that fast. He went through that handbook. And he went inside the thing and started working on the control panel. Came out that evening and said, okay, it's all, all fixed, no problem. He had completely reprogrammed that thing just in a couple of hours. And then the funny part of that story is that he had, he, he really did have, now this is not a funny story, he had another finger right here. He had wow. six fingers. It was kind of stubby and round like a little fat, but it was jointed just like a regular finger. Hmm. He had six fingers on it. He thought it was funny. He was all pop him out and say, look at that. He could type 20% faster than anybody else. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what key he's going to use, but he could. But he, he could sure program that computer, no doubt about it. The English people supplied a lot of knowledge to flight safety. And one of my impressions from Lockheed was that I, I, on the C-5, I dealt with the, the, the autopilot which was a very advanced autopilot for its day, 1965. That was the best there was and new. And uh, like Ryan's going, gone through up here, mm -hmm. it needed a lot of, of breaking in and getting used to. And uh, the, there were English engineers came over there and, and worked that program for a couple of years. Well, I guess, say, say 63, 64, 65. And I worked with them a whole lot. They were. They were a little bit strange. They would get on a chalkboard and take a racer and say, I'm going to obliterate the, the board now. <laughs> Be sure you got it down. So I always remember that they had a funny attitude and knowledge about things. But the autopilot itself was kind of strange, but it worked good and it was logical and, and easy to teach. Uh -huh. I taught the, the autopilot for the C5 in the C5 ground school. We had people in in our flight department teach various parts of the C-5. Nobody taught it all. Uh -huh. It's too much of it. And so I taught the autopilot. So I, we got, got very familiar with it. So the English have supplied a lot of engineering help to our airplane plane programs over the years. Oh, well, that was that was my airplane again in Tulsa. Okay, that's the Tulsa picture. You can't see it, but that's the number five one five seven JF on there. Okay. And that was the Lockheed demonstrator that he bought directly from them. It had probably a couple hundred hours on it when he bought it. Uh -huh. Good as new. This is the interior. Okay. It had maps of the country on these fold out tables so the passengers could trace where they were and we had good passengers we would go back prior to the flight and lay out little colored ribbons on there with with thumbtacks or something, you know. Yep. To show where they're going. That good old gold uh, upholstery and wood grain, dark wood grain, 1970s look. 
It was, I thought it was very pretty. Vintage nice. 70s. I know it was like that. It was a copy of my Jet Star. That's the same as all Jet Stars except the, for the base of the, the real sophisticated instruments. They, they're right in here for the attitude instrument and the DG and so forth were, were very state of the art. Everything else were standard and the engine instruments were all pretty standard all Jet Stars. I'm looking to see if they still got the Doppler in there. And I'm sure it does. I don't remember there. Here it is right here. I had to think a minute for where it is. That was before GPS. Okay. Okay, go ahead and pass that one. Okay, that's my old, old AD4. Sky Raider coming aboard ship. Yeah. Was that just a training? Uh... Yeah, we were just out to sea doing some. I don't remember what we were doing. We we're always doing projects. Yeah, we all talk to you about that a lot. Don't yeah. We? Something special we we're doing. I think on this time I remember we had a bomb rack that we were testing to be sure it would hold the drop properly and hold the bombs on the uh, on arrested landing. Uh -huh. Which is a lot better shock than normal. <laughs> And that's me on the deck of the Yorktown in, in the later years, probably 2000 somewhere in there before I came out here with all the plaques on the wall there mm -hmm. on the side of the island where the Yorktown had served during the war. That says when it was a museum. The Yorktown was a museum at that uh -huh. point. Yeah, yeah, over in Charleston, West Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. And this was surprised me. The Navy didn't have aces, did they? They didn't ever name them. Okay. They had them. They because couldn't. somebody made a book about them. I don't know where they got their information. Well, well just go to the record and see what they find. Yeah. But you, you, you can find that sort of thing by combat reports after every flight you had to go and, and somebody sat Somebody would have to figure all those out. Reported what happened, you know, and what you remembered about it. And they yeah. write it down. And those were all records that filed somewhere. I don't know. The Air Force just made a point of pulling out the shoot downs and accrediting the people okay. because they felt it was good publicity and the Navy didn't. Yeah. That's a good old F F six, F five with a radar yeah. pod on the right wing. There's you at McMinnville. Yeah. Uh huh. Day fighter paint job with the white bottoms. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't want white on a night fighter, would you? No. <laughs> Boy, I mean, you wouldn't. You wouldn't know that. Now, wait a minute. That's missing. Isn't that missing a, a thing on the landing gear? Wasn't there a, another piece that came down on the landing gear? Right there in front of the strut of the landing gear? Right yeah. there, from there down? Yeah. That's on a museum airplane. I, I told you before we yeah. talked about that. That came out of the factory on all the airplanes, but uh, somebody, when they delivered them, somebody they can't take them off right away. Huh. They took off that and the strut cover here. Yeah, that one is what I'm at. Why, was it more drag or something, or just a hassle? Probably a hassle. Yeah. So when no it was folded, the drag is all when smooth. it was retracted, there was a... Uh, smooth. It wasn't smooth as it could be. Yeah, well, it wasn't. Once they were missing, you mean, sure, that's right, they probably... Cut five miles an hour yeah. top speed. That's what I was thinking. But it, the mechanics didn't care about that. <laughs> the Nash pilots. When you were in a dogfight, it made a lot, maybe. Not much in a dogfight. Yeah. Um, speed, not the usual criteria. Turning, turning radius and oh. planning is the, the key to dogfighting. Huh. I always enjoy that picture because the prop is so big. Yeah. Shows it. Shows it. Scale that of it. cockpit and cruising on long range missions with the prop control full down and the RPM as low as you can get it and just seeing those plot braids go by whoosh, 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 just about that fast. They, wow. That thing is turning so slow and they're so far out there they're not turning tip speed, not very much in, in cruise. Huh. What would be the cruise RPM on that? Uh, probably 1800. Wow. That's yeah. full down. It sounds like it's lugging. Uh -huh. You know, it's just barely running. But that's the way you get, that's what Lindbergh taught the Navy and 
the Army. Remember the story about that? How he proved to the Army pilots he, in the P-38 first, he showed them how to extend the range. He extended, I think they were using, uh, seemed like to me, 900 mile max radio radius out and back. Mm -hmm. They could hit targets in the P-38 in the Pacific. And uh, he went out there and flew with them. And, and on his first flight with them, he flew the tail end Charlie, which is the uh, one where you're going to chalk it a throttle the most, which uses more fuel. Okay. The accelerator pump and all, you know. And uh, so he flew tail end Charlie. And when they returned to the field, he had hundreds of gallons more fuel than they did. And mm -hmm. so they listened when he, he went in to give him a lecture about it. He told Didn't them he uh, teach them how to use manifold pressure gauges and to figure out the, to cut back and lean out or something like that. I can't. I remember no, reading a story about that. Not that. It wasn't no, manifold not pressure. Lindbergh. Okay. Somebody else is, is telling you another technique or something. Okay. Lindbergh's was simple and for everybody. He's the every, every man's mind. How did, what was his method? Full low RPM, full throttle, Really? Clean mixture. The huh. only thing he did that I would just hit the stop, so to speak, on throttle and prop was he went to manual lean. All of the throttle quarters in those days had throttle arm, mixture arm, and a prop control. And uh, For pitch? Yeah. That's and, what the prop control was for uh, pitch. And uh, the mixture control had detents, and you had a little then you press to get by the detent, uh -huh. and when you come back and we hit the detent and stop, you press that and you get by it. The first stop was auto ridge. That's where you took off and landed. Okay. And uh, if you wanted full power, you could push it on up mechanically to full ridge further. And uh, if you wanted leaner, you could go press the button and come back to automatic lean, auto lean. Uh -huh. And nobody... And the Navy system never told you, don't ever go by and out, just go to all lean. It doesn't ever touch it beyond that. Lindbergh came out there and said, this thing got a range way back here. Pull it back and watch your temperatures, uh -huh. oil temperature and head temperature, and watch your temperatures. And feel it run rough, and you know, if you pull it too far, it'll start missing. And if you get it just on the edge, it raises the temperature. But you could, you could then ease it up just the tiniest bit, and bring that temperature down five degrees. 10 degrees, mm -hmm. either way. With max pitch in the prop, so he was going for speed. No, max pitch, we use lowest RPM, gives best fuel consumption, and lowest speed. And yeah. You, you usually get in the F6, that'd give you about 130 knots. Just a loafing speed, just barely going. Huh. But it was about the same for TBMs and SBDs, and SB2Cs was all within five miles an hour the same. Huh. And you all did the same thing on all engines. And that's the technique Lindbergh talked, and that's the contribution he made to the war. And it was significant in my opinion. Between him doing that and Jimmy Doolittle, who's really responsible for the 100 low lead fuel, yeah, they made the two for pilots to make significant contributions to flying and therefore to the war at that time. Very yeah. important. There's a lot, of, a lot of talk in the histories that Jimmy Doolittle's 100 low lead May have won the war. May not have, we may not have won the war if we hadn't had it. I don't know. Huh. That's pretty far stretched to me. I don't quite see it, but it might have been. It led the way. There's no doubt about that. Okay, good side view of the old left six. Looks a little longer there than the other view. It looks kind of short. Yeah.